welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. All right, praise God. Are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. Well, listen, you didn't come to hear from me. Hopefully, listen, never go to church, especially never go to church to hear from me, because I, I don't really have anything to say. You know, I'm, I'm kind of that quiet guy, sits back. It's only by the grace of God that anybody can open up the word and explain something to you about God. But listen, that's only half of the picture there. The other half is that you, sitting out there, got to have an open heart to receive and then apply the word of God in your life. So you didn't come to just sit and spectate. You came to come and participate in a process. Yeah, I'm going to be saying some things. I'm going to be explaining some things. But the biggest part relies on you turning your heart to the things of God, tuning in to what God would have to say, paying attention, writing it down, writing notes, getting a hold of it, and then applying it to your life. So if you would, just stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's prepare our hearts to hear from the Holy Spirit tonight as we approach the Word of God. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're grateful that we get to come. We don't have to come. We get to come into the house of God tonight. Lord, what a privilege and an honor that we can be in your presence and, and worship and praise you, God, that, that we can come into a place like this and, and freely lift our hands and our voices to sing and to praise, to just lift you up, Jesus. And, and we thank you for your presence that's here already. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to go further. We want to go deeper with you. So we pray, God, that tonight as we open up your word, that you'd open us up to receive. Open your word up to us, God. We pray that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown tonight. And may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, how wise you are that you can speak a word to each individual in this place, right where they're at, God, that speaks to their life. And Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. No time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody. But Lord, we see ourselves as co-workers and laborers together, building your kingdom, God. We give you all the praise and all the glory. God, be amongst them as you would be amongst us tonight. Speak to them as you would speak to us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. You can be seated. If you would, get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Proverbs. And we're going to start off tonight in Proverbs, the third chapter. And I, I thought we would open up the message tonight with a story. There's a guy by the name of Tim Hansel, and he had a, a book, and he was writing. And he said, one day while my son Zach and I... We're out in the country climbing around some cliffs. I heard a voice from above yell. Now, hold on a second. got to get a picture. Here's a guy, and him and his son are walking around and, and kind of just climbing around some cliffs and, and, and just going around, you know, in, in the countryside, that sort of a thing. And as he's walking, he hears a voice from above, okay? The voice of his son yells from above, Daddy, catch me, all right? He turns around and looks up, and this is what he writes. He says, I turned around to see Zach joyfully jumping off a rock straight at me. He had jumped and then yelled, hey, Dad. I became an instant circus act, catching him. We both fell to the ground. For a moment after I caught him, I could hardly talk. When I found my voice again, I gasped in exasperation, Zach, can you give me one good reason why you did that? Here's the frustrated dad, and, and, and many of us dads can, can relate to this feeling. You know, here's the kids having fun and doing a, something that's, that's really cute and really fun, but you're kind of like, what's going on on the inside of your head? You know, what's wrong with you, boy? And, and so here, here he is. Can you give me one good reason why you did that? Listen to what he responded. He responded with remarkable calmness. Sure, because you're my dad. And I love that story because it speaks of the trust that a son has in his father, that it doesn't matter, I can jump and then yell and get my dad's attention, and he will do whatever it takes to catch me, and I'm going to be all right. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the subject of trusting God, something that each and every one of us, no matter what walk of life, no matter our social status, economic status, doesn't matter where you're at in your education levels or, or, or where you go to work, where you don't go to work, what's going on in your life, you, each and every one of us at any level... At any point, young and old, we're all going to have to grow in this area of trusting God. And oftentimes, we don't have that attitude that that young boy Zach had where we jump first and call later. 
Usually it's we call out, we make sure, we get God's attention. We say, hey, God, I want to make sure that if I jump, you know, that you're going to catch me, God. I want to, I want to make sure that, you know, I, I can see the path. I want, to, I want to see your arms out there, God. I want to, I want to know that you're strong enough to catch me. Or, or, or maybe you're one of those people that really don't trust God at all. And, and you, you almost think that God's a little mean or cruel and that he might have his arms out for a moment but then step back and open his arms and say, oh, shouldn't trust anybody. See, sometimes we have these views of God. And, I, and tonight I would love to give you three easy steps to trusting God, but it, it's simply something that you have to do. You already know how to trust, and you already know how to not trust. How do I know that? Because you trust people. Because you trusted that when you sat down in that chair tonight that it would hold your weight. Because you trust that when you show up on the job tomorrow that there's still a job waiting for you. Because you trust that if you do X amount of days, that there will be a paycheck waiting for you. See, we already know how to trust. We already know what it means to trust. And we already know what it means to not trust. See, there's people that have hurt us, people that have turned their backs on us, things that didn't go our way, and so we had disappointments, and we stopped trusting in certain individuals, in people, sometimes even in God. But tonight I'm here to tell you that just like Zach had that trust in his father that he would catch him, and the only reason he gave that he knew his father would catch him was because he was his dad. I'm here to tell you tonight that the only reason that I can give you tonight that you should trust God is because he is God. Yeah. Plain and simple. And so we can either choose to trust or we can choose to not trust. Now, definitely tonight as we go, you'll see some areas in your life, in your situation, as you look through your own set of glasses tonight at the Word of God and view your situation in light of the Word, you're going to see an area, that's, that's where I can trust Him and this is how I can trust Him. You will see those things tonight. I would encourage you to write those things down. Tell your husband or wife. Talk to your kids about them. Tell your friend about them. Maybe, maybe there, there's somebody that's close to you that you, can, that you can talk to about that area. What does that do? That, that helps you to be accountable to the word. That helps you to stick to what it is that God is calling you to do. And so tonight, I, I, I wish I could give you those three easy steps, but, but you simply know how to do it. And in the fullest sense, you're to trust God, with everything that you are, everything that you have, everything that you ever will be, it should all be 100% totally invested in the things of God. If God was that chair, you would sit down in his lap, trusting fully in him that he's able to carry the weight of your life. Plain and simple tonight. Things to know about trusting God. I got a couple of things that I want you to know, and I believe the Spirit of God is speaking to you tonight. These are things we ought to know about trusting God. We know how to trust God. We know that we should trust God. We know that we need to trust God, but we don't always trust God. But if we know some things about trusting God, it will help us to grow in this area of our life. Things to know about trusting God. Number one tonight is that we have been commanded to trust. When it comes to trusting God, we have been commanded to trust God. Now, we've been commanded to not put our trust in men. We've been commanded to not put our trust in uncertain wealth. We've been commanded to not put our trust in strength or horses or chariots like the Bible says, as some have. We've been commanded to not put our trust in all those other things, but we have been commanded to put our trust in God. Numerous times you'll read the words, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. All throughout the Bible, trust in the Lord. Old and New Testament, you will find trust in the Lord. You're there in Proverbs chapter 3, probably the most famous verse on trusting God throughout the whole Bible, the one that sticks out at least to me the most. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 5, starts with those three same words, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. We're commanded to trust. Notice he doesn't give the easy steps to trusting. He just says trust. Trust in the Lord. How? With all of your heart. In other words, with every fiber of your being, with all that you've got, any amount of strength, any amount of will, any amount of mind and emotion, anything that you can put into this, whatever you've got, invested 100% totally in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then he goes on to say, and lean not on your own understanding. See, if we lean on our own understanding rather than trusting in God, we're not going to get anything done. 
Because we'll start to calculate and we'll start to say, well, this plus this equals this. And, and if I only have this, I can't do that. And all of a sudden it's going to hinder us and it's going to stop us from doing what God would have us to do. But if you trust in the Lord... You, you may see the end result. You may see where God is calling you to. You might see where God is going. And if you trust in the Lord like that little boy, Zach, you will take a running leap and jump and cry out later. Why? Because you know God's going to catch you. Yeah. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Why don't we trust God? I keep coming back to this. Why don't we trust God? I mean, he's God. Creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the one who started it all. He's the one who can go as big as the universe and as small as an atom. I mean, this is God. He blows our minds. He understands everything. He knows everything. He sees right through to the intents of the heart. I mean, this is, this is the, the star breather. This is the one who can come and who can wrap himself in flesh. This is the one who paid the price for our sins. And yet we still don't trust God. Why? Well, because of fear. Well, maybe that happens for you, but not for me. Well, I've seen it in the Bible, but, but that didn't go down that way in my life. Our experience doesn't line up with what we see in the Word sometimes. Or maybe we've been let down by others who called themselves Christians. They were unreliable, and therefore we said, well, God must be unreliable. Or, or, or maybe it could have been that we were disappointed in God, and we, we blame God because things didn't just work out the way that I thought that they should have. And when we do that, we put ourselves on a higher tribunal than God himself. We say, my experience is more valuable than the word of God. We say, my experience is more credible than the word of God. Well, wait a second. The word of God has been around for thousands of years. Tried, tested, true. There are witnesses. There are people who could testify. And your one experience lined up with the millennium and the billions of people probably that could line up and testify in that area, you're going to put that above all those other witnesses? So it's got to be just a choice that we make where we say, you know what? I'm going to trust God. Yeah, I've been let down in the past. Yeah, my experience wasn't that way in the past. Yeah, it didn't happen. It didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. And I was disappointed, but that's not going to stop me from trusting God. Why? Because I've been commanded to trust God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I don't understand how it's going to work. I don't understand why it didn't work before. I don't understand why I prayed for that person and they still were sick. I don't understand why I prayed for finances and, and we went broke. I don't understand why I prayed that we wouldn't lose the house and we still lost it. But the Bible says not to lean on your own understanding, but to just simply trust in the Lord. Put him as higher than everything else in your life. You see, we, we've been commanded not only just to trust God, but not to test God. And there is a difference between trusting and testing. Sometimes people say, well, you know what, God, if that's how you want it to be, then show me a sign. God, God I, I need some assurance here. I need somebody wearing a blue shirt to walk in the door, and, and I need them to hand me a red rose and an envelope with a sticker on it that says Jesus loves you, and then I'll know, God, that this is the will of God for my life. And yet the Bible tells us, don't tempt the Lord your God. And really in the context, when you start learning what it's talking about, it's talking about what we've been talking about in the book of Hebrews. Really, it, it was about the children of Israel complaining against God. Well, God, you, you led us out here into the wilderness, and now there's no water. God, God you led us out here into the wilderness, and there's no food. We're going to die. God, you're giving us this manna each and every day, but we want meat. Aren't you God? And all of a sudden, they're testing him. They're tempting him. And the Bible says, do not tempt the Lord your God. Let's look at it together in the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter number 4. Here Jesus is being tempted by Satan. Matthew chapter number 4. Jesus is being tempted by Satan. And while you're turning to Matthew 4 and verse 6, it says, Jesus said to him, if you're the son of God, then throw yourself down for as written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So Satan lifts him up to a very high place and starts to tempt Jesus and say, oh, go ahead, cast yourself. Take a leap, Jesus. God will catch you. Go ahead, Jesus. Jump off. Jump off and cry out to God later. 
That's trust. You're trusting God, right? Here he is. And what does Jesus respond? Matthew chapter 4, verse number 7. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Here Jesus quotes Deuteronomy, talking about the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah, these bitter waters where they went there and they said, Moses, the waters are bitter. Well, I can't God do anything for us. We're going to die out here in the wilderness. Moses finds a tree and throws the tree into the water and it becomes sweet. And then the very next thing he does, he walks them over to Elam, and there there's ten pools of water for them, just a short walk away. You see, God knows what he's doing. God's leading us. God's taking us somewhere. God's giving us direction. And it's not our job to tempt or to test. It is our job to trust. And therefore, when God starts to lead us in a place and we say, God, there's no water. God, I don't have enough money. God, there's not enough provision. God, I don't have the job. God, I don't have the education. God, I don't have the skills. God, I don't have the personality. God, I don't have the friends. God, I don't have. And, and we start to complain and murmur against God. God says, I don't. No, 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 no. I don't want you to test me. Because just down the road is 10 pools of water. Just down the road is your provision. If you will hold on, child, I will come through. Just Trust me. Just take the leap. Just get out and trust me. A couple of things that we ought to know about trusting God. Number one is that we've been commanded to trust. God doesn't want us to test. God wants us to trust. Second thing for tonight is when we trust God, we take the limits off. Now, I'm going to describe to you what this means in a moment, but, but I, want, I want this to, to sink in for a second. I want you to think about it for a second. When we trust God... We take the limits off. Sometimes we learn by comparison and contrasting, right? We just talked about tempting God. When we tempt God, we limit God. When we tempt God, we limit God. You're there in Matthew. Turn to the book of Psalms with me. Let me show this to you. We were just talking about the children of Israel. Psalms chapter 78. Psalm 78. Talking about the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. How they tempted and they tested God. When we tempt God, we limit God. Psalm 78, verse number 41. I'll let you get there. Psalm 78, verse 41. Recounting the story of the children of Israel in the wilderness. Psalm 78, 41 says, Yes, again and again they tempted God. They kept testing God. They kept pushing God. They kept saying, God, why can't you? God, there isn't. God, we don't have. God, blah, 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 God. And here's God. They're testing him again and again and again and again. And look at what happens. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. What does that mean? That means that by their testing consistently, constantly, they put a limit on what God could do in their lives. Think of it for a moment. Here's a nation walking through a desert. What had just happened to them? Well, they were in Egypt, right? They were slaves. Slaves to the greatest nation on the planet at that time. The greatest military army was at their backs chasing them. Signs, miracles, and wonders had already been done. There were plagues that plagued this nation. They came out with spoil, great spoil. They, had, they asked their neighbors, the Egyptians, for their diamonds, for their rings, for their gold, for all. And they plundered the nation of Israel. They walked out of, I'm sorry, they plundered the nation of Egypt. And they walked out of Egypt. And here the army is chasing them. There they are, and God does a miraculous sign to them. He parts the Red Sea in front of them. They walk across on dry land. And there on the other side, God closes up the waters and with one sweep takes out the greatest army on the planet at that time. The greatest military power, like that, gone as the waves covered them and drowned them in the Red Sea. So this nation now goes and receives the law from God and is walking towards the promised land. If God can do all those plagues, do all those signs, all those wonders, if he can miraculously cause them to have favor with the people that they're plundering 
and they come out with great spoil. And then if he can open up the waters and walk them through on dry land, and after they walk through on dry land, defeat the greatest military power of that time, then why are they complaining about food? And why are they complaining about water? Don't you think that the God who created the heavens and the earth, the one who formed the body, could have sustained them to not have to have food or drink during their time of journey? I mean, this is God. This is the one who knows what they have need of before they ask it of him. God knows they're hungry. God knows they're thirsty. But rather than trusting, they now test God. And rather than have the miraculous testimony that God supernaturally carried them through the wilderness where they didn't even have to eat, now they've limited God's ability in their life. You and I, when we test God, when we murmur, when we complain, when we doubt, when we operate in fear, unbelief, when we start to say, well, God, I don't know why you made me this way. God, why'd you make me? God, why'd you put me here? God, why did I get this job? God, why? God, why? God, why? And when we continue to test God, we start to limit God's power to do the miraculous in our lives. It's time to start trusting God and breaking the limits wide off and opening up our lives. When we trust, we take the limits off of God. Tempting God is like throwing water on a fire. Reduces the effect of the fire until it eventually goes out. You keep dousing a fire in water, eventually that fire is going to go out. And that's why the Bible records in the New Testament, it tells us not to quench the Holy Spirit. It tells us not to resist the Holy Spirit. It tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Why? Because that's not trusting, that's tempting, and you're throwing water on the fire every time you do that. God wants us to trust him. When we trust God, we take the limits off of him and allow him to do his work. Love what Corey Ten Boom said. She said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. See, this is God. This is my God. This is the creator of the heavens and the earth. This is the one who, who started it all, and when it all is wrapped up, he's the one that's there at the end. This is the God who saved my soul from hell. This is the God who pulled me out of where I was and set me up to where I am now. This is the God who's got a greater future ahead of me, greater future ahead of you, greater things ahead of this church, ahead of this city. This is God. I don't want to limit that God. The God who could dream up a duck-billed platypus. The God who, who, who creates things in the ocean that we haven't even found yet. The God who made so many species of insects that in the Amazon rainforest, they're still finding stuff. The God who they've been peering out into the universe and they keep saying, hey, it's bigger than we thought. Hey, it's bigger than we thought. Hey, it's bigger than we thought. That's our God. Why would you want to limit that God? We know this God. He's our God. He's my God. See, you gotta, you got to be possessive about this. That's my dad, and he'll catch me if I jump. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're there in Psalm 78. Turn with me to Psalm 37. Great Psalm. Psalm chapter 37. Take a look at this. Talking about taking the limits off of God when you trust him. Psalms 37. Psalms 37, verse number 3. Psalms 37, verse number 3. Look at these same words. Trust in the Lord. There it is again. Once again, we read it. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Oh, my, my. Hold on a second. We just got done talking about people who are complaining about food, complaining about water. And God says, just trust in the Lord. Dwell, do good. Dwell in the land and feed on food, no. Feed on water, no. Feed on quail, no. Feed on manna, no. Don't worry about any of that other stuff. Feed on just one thing, his faithfulness. Feed on who he is. See, you, see faithfulness means you can trust him. Faithfulness means every time you go there, he'll be there. Faithfulness means any time you call, he answers. That's our faithful God. And so you don't have to feed on the natural things of this world. Don't worry about bread and food and water and clothing and all the stuff here on the earth. That doesn't make a difference. Feed on his faithfulness. Trust him. Trust him. He's faithful. 
Take a look at the next verse, verse number four. Look at what it says. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. See, if you're not delighting yourself in the Lord, you're going to want and have nothing. But when you start to delight yourself in the Lord, when God gets on the inside of you, and all of a sudden you start to rejoice in the things of God, why? Because you trust God. Why? Because he's faithful and he's good. And you start to rejoice in the things of God. God takes a look at that heart and says, they're rejoicing in me, and now I'll give them everything of me, everything I have, every resource that I have. I'll open it up wide to them. Why? Because God is unlimited in his resources. When you desire God and you get more of God, then all of a sudden your life is just overflowing and abundant. Preaching to myself right now. Hallelujah. Verse number five, look at what it says. Commit. Do you know when you trust, you commit? Think about that for a second. When you trust, you commit. Think about somebody looking at a tightrope, right? They could say, I trust that that tightrope can carry my weight and I can walk across to the other side onto the platform over there. But if you really trust, it goes beyond just saying, I trust that rope. No, you've got to commit. Step out and let it hold your weight. See, when you trust, you commit. So here you are, you, you trust in the Lord, you feed on his faithfulness, you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart, and then look at this, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. There it is, two times in three verses. God is hammering the point home to us and saying, this is about trust. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Bring what to pass? Your way. That's what the verse was talking about. Wherever it is you're going, your direction. If, if that tightrope is the direction you're going, then it, when you commit, God will make sure that he'll bring it to pass. He will bring you safely to the other side. God will keep your feet on solid ground no matter what. Doesn't matter the wind comes. Doesn't matter people throw stuff at you. Doesn't matter if the devil's taunting you. What matters is that you're trusting in the Lord. Final thing for tonight. Final thing that we ought to know about trusting in God is that there are promises attached to trust. Now, why do we have to know that? Well, here's the reason why. Because if we know the benefits, if we know the incentives that God attaches to obedience to his word. See, we started with a command. Trust in the Lord, right? With all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And if we obey that command, then there is a promise that is attached to that trusting God. And when we get the promise in our life, now all of a sudden there's joy. There's, there's this overflowing abundance in our lives, and we start to rejoice in it. We start to get excited about it, and then we say, hey, hey, there's a benefit to this, and then we do it more. And then as we get that benefit, now all of a sudden we say, hey, there's a benefit here too, and then we start to trust God in another area of our life. And then we say, hey, there's a benefit here too, and we start to trust God in every area of our life because we now see the benefits coming. So what promises are attached to trust? Well, I don't have time to exhaust all of the promises that are attached to trust. I started reading through them and started saying, wow, the, there's, there's a promise for trust there. And then I read another one. I said, oh, there too. Okay, well, I'll write that down. And then I start. And so finally I had to say, okay, I don't have time to go through every promise about trust in the Bible. So I got, I got just a couple of them for you. How about this one? Peace. Peace. There, there is a promise of peace attached to trust in God. Great promise, especially when there's no peace all around us. World economic situation is, is, is just shaky. There's, there's nations that are having civil wars. It's an election year here in the States, and, and people seem to start getting crazy about that. Stuff's going on. I mean, I mean it, it's just one thing after another, and there's no peace anywhere around. But if you trust in the Lord, you will be like an island of peace. You will be in a Holy Ghost bubble of peace. Why? Because you're trusting in the Lord. Take a look at the promise with me in the book of Isaiah. Great verse to highlight, to underline, to dog ear, whatever you got to do to get back there. If you need this promise in your life, get a hold of this tonight. Isaiah chapter number 26. Isaiah 26. And in Isaiah chapter 26, take a look at verse number 3 with me. Isaiah chapter 26, 
Verse 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Look at this. Because he trusts in you. Wow. See, when, when you keep your eyes on Jesus, you'll be at perfect peace. Think about Peter. Here he is. He says, sees the Lord walking across. He says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out. Jesus says, come, right? Peter steps out of the boat. Here he goes. He's walking on the water. He's walking towards Jesus. Wind and waves all around. But he's in a perfect bubble of peace. Why? Because he's got his eyes fixed on Jesus. All of a sudden, the wind comes up and the waves come up and start to roar around him and roll around him. And he gets his eyes off of Jesus and starts to look at the wind, starts to look at the waves. And what happens? He starts to sink. Why? Because he got his eyes off of Jesus. But the moment he cries out, Jesus, save me, the next word that comes out is immediately. When he got himself off of the problem and back on Jesus, immediately, there was the Lord to catch him and pick him up and get him back in the boat. There's a promise of peace. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Here's another one, strength. Strength, we all need strength. We need strength every day. We, we can't go on unless our strength is renewed. We, we will wear out like a battery. Eventually, we will just stop working. Life goes on. Things take place. We get weary. We get jaded. And sometimes we just need fresh strength. Well, listen, if you trust in the Lord, the Bible has a promise of strength. You're there in Isaiah 26, 3. Take a look at the next verse, Isaiah 26, 4. Look at what it says. Trust in the Lord forever. For in Yah, or the Lord God, Jehovah God, for in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. Well, I don't think you guys got that. For in the Lord is everlasting strength. See, a battery may run out. A man may run out. A, a horse may run out. They haven't built a perpetual energy machine yet that can fuel itself. But in God, God always has strength. Why? Because it's everlasting strength. It's the God strength. And when you trust in the Lord, it's almost like you take the cord of your life and you plug it into the power source. That's why Elijah could outrun a chariot. That's why Jesus could continue to go on and preach. That's why the Apostle Paul could endure so many afflictions. Why? Because in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. Because even though, as the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, even though we had the sentence of death in ourselves, we trusted in God who raises the dead. So even if you feel like you're on your last leg... You've done all, you've spent all, you've, you've given all, and you're just dried up. There's no more. Listen, if you trust in the Lord, God can raise you up from that dead place and cause you to move on. Sometimes we look at our situation, we say, God, the situation's dead. God, there's nothing else that can be done. God, God it's done. The, the, the papers have been signed. They've already taken it. It's, all, it's six feet under God. And God says, well, hey, so was Jesus, and I raised him up from the dead. I can take your dead situation and turn it around and bring life where you thought that it couldn't be done. But you got to trust him. You've got to trust him. How about, how about this one? I'll give you a two for one on this one, okay, because it's in the same section of Scripture. How about these two? Blessing and prosperity. Blessing and prosperity. Blessing is the capacity to succeed. I love how the Amplified Bible, whenever you read blessed, it says happy and to be envied. Wow. That means that you can live a blessed life. You can have the capacity to succeed when you trust in the Lord. And you can be happy when you trust in the Lord. You know, we, we sang that song tonight, Oh Happy Day. Man, a, a big smile just comes on my face anytime. And when we sang, Oh Happy Day, which was the old, you know, the old gospel tune, we sang that this weekend on, on, on the Father's Day communion. A big old smile came across my face. Why? Because I, I'm, I'm blessed. I am so blessed. I'm blessed. If nothing else ever happened in my life, I just got saved. That, that would be enough. That would be enough. Why? Because I trust in him. I trust that no matter what happens here on the earth, that I get to be with Jesus when it's all said and done. 
and I can put a smile on my face and be happy. We can be happy. We can put a smile on our face. We don't have to be discouraged, down, depressed. We don't have to stay in those places. But not only blessing, but also prosperity. We can prosper. Now, sometimes people look at prosperity and they say, oh, biblical prosperity. There is no biblical. We should be like Jesus who had nothing. And, and he, you know, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nothing. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus had so much money that his treasurer was stealing from him and he still had ministry. So you tell me that Jesus had nothing. Oh, and by the way, he's the king of glory. He owns it all. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. His streets in heaven are paved with gold. That means that that's just his asphalt. That, that's what he walks on. That's under his feet. That's not true wealth. Well, I'm not talking about money in your pocket or what you're driving. Or It's not all about the Benjamins. It's all about Jesus. And if you've got Jesus, then you've got the true wealth of the kingdom. See, we get all hung up on stuff. Prosperity is not stuff. Prosperity is when your family's serving the Lord. Prosperity is when you're joyful, happy to be envied. Prosperity is when you've got an abundance. Prosper and, 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 you know, you could put the scale and all that kind of stuff up against it and see, but true riches are not measured in material things. True riches are measured in people, in faith, in purity, in holiness, in the word of God, in the relationship with God. That's how true wealth is measured. And so if you're prosperous then you are happy, you are to be envied, you are blessed, and you have an abundance for everything in life. Let's take a look at it in the Word. You're there in Isaiah. Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, just one book over. Jeremiah chapter number 17. Jeremiah chapter number 17. We're going to take a look at two verses talking about blessing and prosperity. The promise for trusting God. Jeremiah chapter number 17, verse number 7, and verse number 8. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 7. If you can read the first word, go ahead and shout it out loud. What is it? Blessed. Oh, that was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Blessed. You guys sound like you've been out there working all day. Some of you guys might have just drove in, didn't even have dinner, and you're like, Blessed. <laughs> come on, come on. Get that strength. Trust the Lord right now, okay? Tap into the power source, and, and let's all read it together. Jeremiah chapter number 17, verse number 7, the first word, if you can read it, go ahead and shout it out, says what? Blessed. There it is. Blessed. Happy. To be envied. There's the promise of blessing in your life. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. There's the blessing, there's the promise of blessing, but let's not stop there. Let's go on to prosperity, verse number 8. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. How many of you got some heat applied to your life right now? Come on, somebody. How many of you at the, at the job, the boss has been leaning over your cubicle, taking a look at what you're doing? How many of you people have been hating on you? How many of you got some heat coming into your family? All of a sudden, there's contention, there's strife, there's division, there's things taking place. How many of you got people knocking on the door? Hey, the bills need to be paid, and all of a sudden, you feel the heat. Listen, listen to what the Word says. It says, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes. You don't have to be afraid. Why? Because you're trusting in the Lord. You're doing what God has called you to do. You're believing God and you're trusting that God will come through. Will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought. Listen, there's been a long year of drought that's been going on. It's all over the world right now. Don't kid yourself. And this area, San Bernardino, has been hit the hardest. Have you noticed it hasn't bounced back? You know, you, you're reading the newspaper. Oh, these cities are all doing great. What about us? But listen, you don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be worried, biting your fingernails. What's going to go on? I don't know how it's going to take place. I don't know how it's going to happen. Listen, put all that stuff away. Doesn't matter what's going on around you. Why? Because your roots have dug deep into the things of God and are spread out by the streams of living water. Will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. 
oh, where everybody else is destitute, dried up, doesn't have anything, doesn't have enough, you're going to have more than enough. Doesn't matter what season it is, it may not be the season for fruit, but you're not going to cease from yielding fruit. Why? Because you are tapped into the power source. You're connected to Jesus. You're trusting in the Lord. Three things that we learned tonight. Three things that we learned tonight to know about trusting God. Number one is that we have been commanded to trust. This is not optional. This is not something you can opt out of as a Christian. If you are a Christian, you can't even get saved without trusting in God for your salvation. We have been commanded to trust, number one. Number two is when we trust God, we take the limits off. Now, all of a sudden, the Almighty God, creator of the heavens and the earth, can do what he wants to do in your life because you trust him. And number three, there are promises attached to trust. And we looked at peace, we looked at strength, and we looked at blessing and prosperity. Let me close with this tonight. Dwight L. Moody said these words. He said, trust in yourself, and you are doomed to disappointment. Trust in your friends, and they will die and leave you. Trust in money, and you may have it taken away from you. Trust in reputation, and some slanderous tongues will blast it. But trust in God, and you are never to be confounded in time or eternity. You got something from God tonight. Give him a great big praise. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory. I'd like to ask everybody to remain seated. Please, nobody get up. No one leave. During this time, hundreds of people already got up because I didn't say stay seated, most likely. And so everybody got up and left. So I'm asking you, please, don't be rude to the Holy Spirit. Let's not pour water on the fire right now because God wants to move and do some things. And let's trust him that he'll take care of our needs for a couple more minutes and then we'll let you go, okay? So please stay seated. Listen in to what God has for you. Turn off your phone if you need to. And just focus into what God wants to speak to you right now. I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. What if, God forbid this should happen to anybody, but what if tonight was your last night here on the earth? You went to your car, you turned your car engine on and your heart stopped. You closed your eyes here on earth and you opened your eyes in eternity. Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Where would you go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Now, I don't think anybody in this room is answering that question saying, I want to go to hell because we know that hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place that no one wants to go. And it'd be foolishness to think that we want to go there. And so I'm not even going to go there with you right now because no one wants to go to hell. Sometimes people will deny the existence of hell, though, and they'll say, well, you know, I really don't believe in hell. I... I, I think that, you know, there's different stuff that goes on and, and you know, you, you get there your way, I'll get there my way, we'll all get to heaven, you know, some way or another and, and God's a good God and he, he's going to get me there somehow. You have your belief, I have my belief and that's good enough. Well, listen, did you know that Jesus in the Bible talks about hell? It's a very real place. In fact, in the Old and the New Testament, the Bible speaks of hell. And so I don't want you to go there. God doesn't want you to go there. It wasn't created for you, it was created for the devil and his angels that rebelled against God. And so let's not be foolish enough to just think that because we don't believe that something exists, that that makes it cease to exist. It's like saying, I don't believe in, in, in semi-trucks. We could say that as much as we want, and we could believe it and go step out on the slow lane of the freeway. We'll meet one face to face eventually. And so just by denying the existence of hell doesn't make it any less real. Tonight, you've got to find out if you're going to go to heaven or if you're going to go to hell. Some of you in this room might answer that question and said, well, I, I think I would go to heaven. I think so. Some of you said, I hope I would go to heaven. I really hope so. Some of you said, well, hmm, maybe I'd go to heaven. I really don't know. The problem with those three statements is that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can think, hope, or maybe your way into the kingdom of God. You've got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Nowhere in the Bible does it say just think, 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 and whoever's the most positive thinker. Hope, 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 and whoever has the most hope, or maybe your way you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. In fact, Jesus came and he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven and we got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. we got to get there God's way. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's cool because I know that God lets good people into heaven. I've been really good, been nice to my neighbors, gave my money to charity. Therefore, I'm good. God's going to let me into heaven for being good. But once again, the problem with that statement is that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough to get to heaven. 
You know when the Bible says, be this good, or you know, if you, if you do these things, that you get to go to heaven. It's not by works, the Bible says. You're not gonna get to heaven just by being good and doing a lot of good things. It doesn't work. If that's how you think you're gonna get to heaven, then I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not gonna make it. Some of you might say, well, hold on a second, because, you know, not only have I been good, but, you know, I was raised in church. But as a young child, my parents took me to church, told me we were Christians. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. And, and they took me to religious classes like Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism class. I'm going to cross for St. Christopher around your neck or had you baptized or christened as a child. And therefore, you're going to go to heaven. But could you show that to me in the Bible? Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that your parents take you to church as a child, call you a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're born in America, that America is a Christian nation, and everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. Come on, let's talk, let's not play games. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, or be baptized or christened as a child, that that gets you into heaven. That's how you think you're going to get there. You're not going to make it. Come on, let's love you enough and respect you enough to tell you the truth tonight. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, okay, well, not only when I was a child did I go to church, but here I am in church right now. I'm sitting in front of you, and, and, and I, I'm a Christian. I, I go to church. Could you show that to me in the Bible? Though, where it says you attend a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Any more than you can go down to the Pacific Ocean, sit in the water, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. It doesn't work like that. Just be a human sitting in the water. Nowhere in the Bible does it say sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. So you might say, okay, I understand that, but in my last church, I got involved. You know, I helped out, I carried the pastor's Bible, I made decisions in that church sang in the choir and taught in the Bible classes. I even got a membership card to that church. It's great, I'm glad you did those things, but once again, could you show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven, where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You sing in the choir, teach in the Bible classes, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven and denying hell. It doesn't work like that. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that God is waiting for you at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to enter. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody say, ah, ah, but I got you on this one. Somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you from the Old and the New Testament. Doesn't that make me a Christian? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you read your Bible? Because the Bible says the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. If you read the Bible, you'll find the devil quoting scriptures. That doesn't make him a Christian headed for heaven, denying hell. So everybody look up at me for a moment. This is not about what's in your head. This is not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is in your head, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven and denying hell. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They branded it as such craziness and weirdness and all that other stuff. But listen, this is not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, it's always meant the same thing from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. This is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. In the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to you here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means, a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not your everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, come on, let's love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. How do I know? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, 
here's your opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to go like this. One, two, three, bang. Pop my hands together when I say three. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. But get over it. Because isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Tonight, don't make that trade-off. God is looking for all of your heart and all of your life. Will you give it to him by confessing and move forward? Man, I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. But he says, if you deny me, I will deny you. So your call, your choice. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or confess Jesus as Lord tonight. Acknowledging your need for him by simply raising your hand in a moment. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in your heart? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, wherever you're at in the world, you can raise your hand. God's watching. And then if you're online, you can click a button that says respond to God, and you'll be led in a prayer. Inside this auditorium, wherever you're at here on campus, come on, get ready to get your hands up. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high right now. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you guys. There's three. There's four. Thank you. There's five. Thank you. There's six up in the family room. Is there seven up in the family room as well? My answer right there. Is there two in there? Thank you. Thank you. There's seven. There's eight. Got you right here. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? There are eight wise people. There's nine. There's ten up on top. Thank you. Got you. Over here, there's 11. Got you right there. Back in that family room, is there anybody back there? Nobody in that family room. Thank you. There's 11, 12. Thank you. About a dozen wise people. If you need to give God all your heart and all your life, come on. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? About 12. I got you, brother. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? All right. Let's give the Lord a hand for 12 wise people. (laughs) Hallelujah. All right. All 12 of you or anybody else that you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do in a moment. We're going to stand, give a clap and a shout. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. As we do that, as we stand, I want you, if you raise your hand or you should raise your hand, get a hold of your stuff, your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should raise your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. Lord, I give you Hallelujah. My come on, let's give a hand. I give you, you can my come too. Soul. I'll live for you alone. Everybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. I take, every moment I'm away. Go in the family rooms, bring your kids. Come on, they're welcome. Have your way in me. Lord, I Come on, come on. If that's you, you need to come. You just make your way to the front right now. I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Come on, come on, come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. You can come too. They're still coming. Come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart. All right, hallelujah. They're still coming, so let's just have them come on up over here. They can listen as they come, all right? Hallelujah. All right. Hey, everybody up front, do do me a favor. Look up here. Put one of these on your face. Put a big smile on your face, okay? This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? You're going to heaven. You're not going to hell, all right? Came to life, not to death. We were talking about blessed. When you get saved, the Bible says you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, you may not understand what that means, but remember to be blessed is the capacity to succeed and that you are happy 
and to be envied. So you can put a smile on your face right now, okay? Now, I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. Right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? He's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are. Number one thing he's going to do is going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, and you're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff, a couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. You need to find out, hey, now that I'm a Christian, what do I do? Okay, just some simple reading, maybe take you about a half hour to read if you sit down and read straight through. Listen, you invest more time into television, movies, video games, all sorts of other stuff, Facebook, all that other stuff, right? You can invest maybe a half hour into sitting down and finding out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. Now, what is a spiritual personal trainer? Well, you heard of a physical trainer. Helps you get strong in the gym, right? Teaches you how to work out, kind of encourages you, calls you during the week, that sort of thing. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. They'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back and serve the devil, but that you go on with God, okay? So if you guys can make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah.